Our text this morning is from Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owners of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those, when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when they first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Do you not, did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I, if I wish to give to this last man the same as to you, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come now to your word. In the beginning was the word, and you breathed into existence and shaped all matter by the power of that word. Lord, we ask you that you repeat your miracle of creation. By the power of your word, mold us and make us. Where repentance is non-existent, speak your word and let it be. Where righteousness is lacking, send your son that his righteousness might be formed in us. And where our spirits are failing because we have no hope, give us Jesus and create our hopes anew. We ask that you do these things by the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of your righteous son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you were at CRF um, a couple of weeks ago, then God must be convinced that you have a problem with envy because you're getting it again. A quick, scenario, a quick summary of the text here, and then we're going to be kind of jumping around a bit. Here we have um, a number of workers sent out into the vineyard, agreeing at the front end that they'll work for a whole day for one denarius. That's the agreed upon contract with the first workers. And they're sent out at the first hour. And the way the, the time works here, um, the, the daylight hours are just divided into 12. So the first hour is the first hour of daylight, and then 12 would be sunset, not midnight. Other workers are hired later on at various intervals throughout the day, throughout the rest of the day, some at the third, the sixth, and then lastly, right at the 11th hour, which would be just shortly before sunset, so they only work a little bit. And they are all sent out into the vineyard as well. But each of these workers is promised that he will be paid whatever is right. Okay, whatever is right. So there's two contracts here. The first contract is for, to the first group that started the first hour, and they're going to be pay, paid one denarius. The second contract is what everybody else gets, and that is they'll be paid whatever is right. Then at the end of the day, the workers all come in to be paid, and when they're paid, he begins with the last first. Okay, so the the, the last to be um, to start working get paid first, and even though um, they only showed up for the last little bit they get paid a denarius. So they get paid a denarius. And those that started at nine, at the ninth hour, they get paid. And it works all the way back until it's the workers who started at the very beginning. And it would seem that um, given the fact that they've worked the length of the day, they worked through the heat of the day, through the, um, the afternoon heat, they worked the whole day, they've done so much more than those that came in at the end. To them, it would seem that they, they really, by, um, by all rights, ought to get a lot more. But they just get one denarius. And they object to this. They, they object to this because what the other guys have gotten. It seemed like with respect to others, they ought to be getting more. But the owner takes them back to their original agreement and he sell, tells them, I am doing you wrong, no wrong. No, no, um, no injustice has been done to you in giving you this because I, I gave to you exactly what we agreed on beforehand. Now, 
in their mind, though, to their mind, they had been terribly wrong. They had been tragically wrong. Why, why was that? If you evaluate the situation, if you think about it, if you evaluate the situation according to a horizontal standard, if you evaluate by a horizontal standard, then they had been wronged. Think about that for a moment. Horizontally and subjectively, they had been terribly wronged. Um, but according to the vertical objective standard, they'd been done no wrong whatsoever. They had been paid exactly what they had been promised. Okay? Looking to the sideways, if they compare themselves to the other workers, they've been wronged. But looking objectively at the contract that they'd been given from the landowner, no wrong had been done to them. And that little comparison there, that is the essence of the sideways glance. And the sideways glance is what uh, this sermon is all about. This is the essence of the sideways glance. It's the definition of it. It is when you prefer to evaluate your circumstances relatively rather than objectively. It's when you evaluate your circumstances based on looking to the left and looking to the right, looking and seeing what this guy is getting and what this guy is getting and comparing yourself to those situations rather than looking objectively to what God has given you. When you, when you look sideways like that, then you get discontent. That's when envy begins to creep in. And that sideways glance is when you, when you begin to evaluate things subjectively rather than objectively. Your own contentment then begins to depend on your position relative to your neighbor. Your contentment is dependent on your position relative to your neighbor, not on your position before God. And this happens all the time, right? You're happy with your piece of pie. You get a piece of pie served up to you. You're perfectly happy with it. This is wonderful until you see the piece of pie next to you and you realize that it's a good quarter of an inch wider. And, and, and you, were just, you were just fine with what you had until you saw what he had. I can, be, I can be perfectly happy with a piece of pizza that my wife brings me on the plate. It's wonderful. I've just got a piece of pizza and everything is great. And, but if I was to stand there and look as she was slicing it up and as she was dishing it out and I were to notice how there are other pieces with a good two to three more slices of pepperoni on them, then suddenly all of my contentment, all of my thrill, all of my joy that I would have gotten from this slice, it's immediately taken away. Because why didn't I get that one over there? You start, you start evaluating what you have based on what you don't have by looking to the side rather than what has been given to you, what's been placed right in front of you. And we do this with all the walks of our life. We do this throughout our life. Um, and it plays out something like this. Uh, my job is, is really unfair. My job is really unfair. Why? Because there are other people there that are getting paid more than me. If, you were to, if I was to just, when I, when I get the contract and look at it, I think this is fair, this is great, I love this, I'd love to do this work. And then suddenly I look and I see what's on somebody else's contract. I see what somebody else is getting on their paycheck. And suddenly I am getting robbed. I am getting uh, abused and used and milked for all I'm worth because look at what he is getting. I was fine with the contract when it was offered to me, but as soon as I know what somebody else is getting, I'm completely discontent. Um, other people who are less qualified than me are being put in, in front of me. Other people at work are getting recognition when I am not. Other people get the high from the boss and he just walks right past me. I get none of the recognition. I am not being treated fairly. My home life, my home life is unfair. I look around and, and I see other men will have their wives the way they care for their husbands. It's not what I think I'm getting. And I start to get discontent because I don't feel like I'm getting what other, what other men, the way they're being provided for. Or conversely for ladies, you look around and you say, my husband is not caring for me um, physically, uh, emotionally, spiritually. He doesn't lead me, he doesn't shepherd me, he doesn't do that the way I see other men do it. I see videos of, of men giving sermons and I think that, that would be a real husband. If I had a husband like that, then, then I could respect that kind of man, but that's not what I'm getting at home. When he proposed, it all looked great, but then when I started looking around, looking left, looking right, and seeing what other people are getting, suddenly it doesn't seem so good. Or flip it around, everybody else is married and I'm not. I'm single. Right? You, 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 you're fussing about your husband, you're fussing about your wife, but you have a husband, you have a wife. Right? Um, I'm, I don't even have that. I'm all alone and all by myself. And that's why it's so hard for me. I can look left and right and everybody else, his families and kids, and here I am uh, sitting by myself. It's not fair. It's just not fair. Or as, as children, you can be talking about my, my parents 
Other, other people's parents, they take them on these amazing vacations. They go to Europe or they, they go to a lake cabin every year. But we go to a, a, an RV stop in Winnemucca once a year. And, and that's, that's the extent of our vacation. I don't get what other kids are getting. I don't get what they're getting. Um, or as parents, you can conversely look at your kids. And, and my kids, they're not like other people's kids. Other people's kids, every time you say something to them, it's sir and ma'am and thank you and please. And they're like that. And I can't get my kids to keep their finger out of their nose. That's just, my, my kids are nothing like everybody else's. And everything, everybody has the better situation. Everybody has the greener grass. And it's just not fair. So my lot in life is unfair. My looks, my brains, my skills, my athleticism, my wit, it's all unfair. I haven't been dealt fairly with. And it's unfair because when I look left and right, other people are getting what I wish, and I immediately conclude that I've been done a great injustice. I see, um, I see a bunch of people with deep friendships. You know, you go, you go to school, or you go to work, or you go wherever, and you see people all around that are in these tight, close friendships and you're not in those friendships, right? You're, you're excluded in some way. And it's funny how you see a tight friendship over there that you're not in, and it instantly becomes a wrong that's being done to you because you're being excluded, right? They have a friendship that's not yours, and so that's them wronging you. They've excluded you. We talk, you know, you, and what we'll say is it's clickishness. It's a bunch of clicks. They're all, they're all clicky. But um, complaining about clickishness is just another way of expressing friend envy. You, they have something that you don't have. You're, you're not getting to partake in that, and that is somehow, in your mind, turned into them wronging you. And, and parents will do this on behalf of their kids all the time. Um, we, we see other children getting all sorts of opportunities and blessing that our children seem to be in one way or another excluded from. And when we see our children somehow excluded from these things, we instantly conclude that they are being wronged, that they are being treated unfairly. So it's not fair for me, it's not fair for my family, it's not fair for whatever. Um, and, and we can start complaining about it our church as well, right? I, I, um, I, I wonder how many people are watching uh, the video online right now and saying to themselves, it's not fair. <laughs> I, should be, I should be in a church where I had Doug Wilson for my pastor. That would be justice. Look at all of those people at Christ Church and they get to have this. I should be there. I should be getting sermons be rebuking me for envy. That should be, <laughs> that should be my lot in life. It, it's very easy. All these little discontentments work their way in, and they tell us that we have been robbed. They tell us that we've been treated unjustly. Um, we do this all the time when we're feeling fussy about our lot in life, but it's purely just subjective fussing. Uh, it's the sidelong glance. And not only, um, not only is it that, it's, um, it's preferring... If you think about it this way, it's not just looking sideways, but it's always preferring the, the, the most negative possible comparison imaginable, okay? Because I, when I do the sidelong glance, right, I, somehow all of the people who don't have any of the blessings that I have, who don't have remotely close to the blessings that I have, all of those people are completely off the screen, right? I, I look to the left, I look to the right, I manage to only single out the people who have a little bit more than me, and those are the people I compare myself. I completely miss the thousands and thousands of people who don't have what I have. And then after I have deleted out 99.9% .9 of the world's population, I take that you know, that 0.1% and say, it's not fair that I don't have that. I, I know you've heard um, Doug Wilson um, preaching before and, and, and make this comparison to the blessings that we have and how each of us have um, just in our cars or in our pockets, I can pull out my phone and I have, I have technology here that Napoleon would have sold his whole kingdom for. Every, you know, everything that he had, he would have given for all the little, silly little things that I can do with this. And yet I can look at this and I can say, it's not fair. I, I have the iPhone 3, it's not even a GS, it's not a 3GS. Everybody else has the iPhone 4 and they can do video chats with their wife, you know? I can't do video, I can just do pictures. I can 
text my wife a picture of my toe, and that's it. All right? I, don't, I don't have what everybody else has, and I can get myself all worked up about how it's so unfair how I don't have what other people have, and yet the very thing I'm fussing about has put me at the very pinnacle of all of human history, the, the, what I have just in that pocket. It's crazy how we can um, just dismiss everything and just find that one thing that we can envy about, that one little thing that we can covet about, and that's the only thing that we can notice. And it, it's become, it can become such an all-consuming vice that we no longer um, find satisfaction in the blessings that we have. The blessings that we do have, we don't find satisfaction in those things as blessings um, in and of themselves. We only find satisfaction in them in the, to the degree that they're able to create this sensation of covetousness in others. Have you, have you noticed that? I, I look at um, just sort of the, the world of social media, um, all the things that are going on in social media. How much of that is about basically giving you venues to set yourself up in the most enviable position possible? <laughs> um, these are little, um, it, it's, um, it's like immod immodest dressing of the soul where we're trying to inspire lust in covetousness and covetousness in others through everything that we do, everything that we experience. We try to experience it in such a way that other people will look to us and be envious. Um, how, many, how many blog posts uh, could be most accurately filed under the headings of, please envy me for my domesticity, my marriage, my pious reflections, my whatever. How much of it are we actually truly trying to help and teach and inspire others, and how much of it is us actually trying to inspire um, jealousy and envy in others that are looking at us? Um, there's a great quote from, um, by Lewis in That Hideous Strength where he's compares, comparing the mythical character Lilith with Eve, and he says, to desire the desiring of her own beauty is the vanity of Lilith, but to desire the enjoying of her own beauty is the obedience of Eve. It's a very, very subtle distinction. To have something that you want others to enjoy or to have something that you want others to want. It's a very subtle distinction, but it makes all the difference in the world, in your heart, and how you're treating the gifts that God has given you. Do you have them because you want to see others enjoy them, or do you have them because you want to see others longing and lusting for what, uh, what you have? I'm remember, reminded of the, what's the rock song, I, I want you to want me. <laughs> it, it's, it, that's not love. It's um, this, this mutually edifying lust. Okay? It's a desire to have others uh, desire you. And we could go back through this whole list of different categories that I've already listed, and we could flip it all the other way, because there's, there's the fussing about what you don't have, and then there's the relishing what you do have in such a way that you want others to lust after it. So maybe instead of having the kids that, were, that, that you were embarrassed, you have the kids that are absolutely perfect, and you know it, and, and you find great delight in it. My children, my sons, their hair parts perfectly with no calyx. You know, they are dressed perfectly at all time, and I am the model of domesticity. I am the model of godly uh, masculinity. My home, my, my uh, family worship sessions, the angels themselves come down uh, to enjoy. And, and you, you can, all of these elements of your life, you can start to enjoy them in such a way that you're enjoying them solely because of with this sort of sideways glance where you're looking to see who is looking at me as I enjoy these things, as I am blessed with these things. I can't really enjoy it myself unless I see other people coveting it and longing for it. This is a petty little poison. It, it's, it's poisonous, it's wicked, it destroys us, but it is petty. It's really very petty. It's a very small little things. Um, and tragically though, although these things are petty, they can add up, they add up and become this terribly great poison. Each of these little things, um, the, the thing that makes this dangerous is there, there are some sins that when they pop in your head, you know that was a big one. You know, ah, I can't have that in my head. I can't walk around wishing that I would be able to kill somebody. And you know, you know you can't do that, so you confess it and you deal with it. But these thoughts, when they pop into your head, they're little things. They're silly, stupid, little thoughts. You see somebody walk by and you thought, and you liked his socks and you kind of coveted them. And then, and then that's in you, 
But it's so stupid. I mean, it, it, it's so little and silly and small that you, you can't even admit to yourself that that sin just went into you. It's the, the big ones you know, murder, oh, I can't do that, and you confess it. But, but these little ones are so small that you don't want to even dignify it with the acknowledgement that you just sinned there. And so it, it slips right by and it goes deep down into your heart. They're petty, little, stupid, insignificant thoughts. Somebody walks by and he had a funny look on his face and it kind of tweaked you because you wondered what he was thinking and it sort of bugged you. But then it's in. It's in you, and you don't feel like you can really confess it because it was such a stupid thing. But there it is inside of you, adding up and growing into this dis great discontent. Um, Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, 24, Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But, some of those, but those of some men follow later. Uh, I, I imagine there are a bunch of people lined up in hell as people are coming through the, the, the entryway. And they come in and they keep saying, yeah, we were expecting him. Yeah, we knew he was coming. But then somebody comes along and everybody goes, whoa, didn't see that one coming. Didn't, didn't know that was there. Because there are, there are some sins that are just glaring and obvious and they, they consume us from the outside in. Everybody sees it. But there are other sins that just get deep down inside and then slowly build up from the inside and you can keep this real facade on forever and nobody really sees it coming. Proverbs 14.30 says, A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. Envy is that rottenness that gets on the inside that other people just plain can't see. They don't know it, and, and oftentimes you yourself don't see it at, for the most part. You know, if you were to really be completely brutally honest with yourself, you could catch it. But most of the time you'll skim right over and you will not notice that it's building up on the inside. But once this poison gets in, these petty little, um, little drips of toxic poison get slowly dropped into your bloodstream. As they build, they rot from the inside out. And, and this is usually what has happened, I think, when there's, when there's someone that you just can't stand. Um, I, I remember saying this at CRF. I said something like, you know, everybody, you know somebody that in, in your life that like, you just can't stand, and instantly everybody just goes. And, and because it, that's nearly universal. We all have, um, there are people in your lives that start to just grate on you. They start to annoy you. You start to not be able to stand being around them. And, and if somebody asks you, why is it this person is so hard for you? It, it's kind of hard to actually name something. They didn't ever come up and just punch you in the stomach. They didn't ever, they didn't ever like embezzle 20 grand from you, okay? Those, those are things that if you could name those, well, like, okay, our, we understand why you're having a hard time um, forgiving your brother. But sometimes, or most of these situations, there's no single little thing like that, or big thing like that that you can name. And you don't really know what it is. It's just this general, that person just annoys me. They just drive me nuts. They're pompous, they're vain, they're um, obnoxious, they're, and, and, and you've got these sort of general things that you paint them with, but you don't have specific because he did this one terrible, awful thing. Um, you, you, you can't name that one thing. The reason why, usually, you can't name that one thing is because it's a thousand, ten a thousand little itty bitty things, and none of them was actually a sin against you. None of, none of them was, not once did this person actually wrong you. What happened was, they walked by and you, you coveted something. You got envious of something. And it might not have been, I, I, use, the, I use the example of socks, and I, and, I, and I continue to use ridiculous um, things. But the, I'm doing that on a purpose because it's always ridiculous, little, petty, stupid things that trigger this and that slowly build up. But somebody walks by and something happened where they got the best of you. Whether it maybe it was they had something you wish you had, maybe they, they got cut a break that you just keep not getting that sort of break. Maybe, they, um, maybe they're just um, possibly slightly superior than you in an objective sense. Maybe this person is smarter than you. Maybe this person is better at their job than you. Maybe this, position, this person has done better in their career than you. Maybe this person um, has the looks that you wish you had, this, the athleticism you wish you had. Maybe this person in Friendly exchanges constantly gets the best of you with those little jokes, okay? Have they wronged you? 
Aren't you tried to make a joke at them and theirs was better? And, but, but for some reason, because that keeps happening, because their wit is slightly sharper than yours, and they're just a little bit ahead of you, it adds up. It adds up. And those petty little complaints of yours go in, and they begin to swell inside until you are just flat out bitter at that person. And you can't say, well, it's because he's got nicer sock collection than me. Because that would just be stupid, and you can't say that. And so what you say is, it just drives me nuts. That person, he's just, he's very arrogant. He's just very, um, she's just very vain. She's just very, and, and you just paint their whole person because you can't name the sin because actually the sin was yours. I'm, I'm convinced as, I, as you sort through different disputes and arguments and bickerings and whatnot, um, when there's an actual um, clash, how often was it inspired by an actual objective sin, you know, like he snuck over the night, shot my dog. Okay, objective sin, and that sparks the clash. Well, that would be objective, but very rarely is it that. It almost always starts with, I felt like he was. I felt like she was. It's imputive motives that start most of these um, clashes. This petty poison then builds up over time, and as it builds up, it just destroys the body of Christ. You, here's just a short-term example of this. Um, this is almost proverbial. You'll see this. You know, two girls who have been best friends from uh, kindergarten through high school, and they graduate from high school, and they decide they're going to go off to college together, and they're going to be roommates together at college. Um, you, uh, now, if you've if you've seen the story, you know what happens. They, by the end of their freshman year, they absolutely cannot stand each other, and they've gone back, and they've burned all the yearbooks, they've burned everything, and they've tried to wipe the, the, the earth clean of the recollection of that other person. Because what happens is, it's not, it's not that they were incompatible. Obviously, they'd been best friends all the way through high school. But then you plunk them down as roommates together, their freshman year in college, and they're beside each other, they're with each other nonstop at all times, and the, the level of toxicity in their blood system from all of the petty poisons that are being thrown in just goes all the way up. They're completely rotted out from the inside by spring break, and they cannot stand each other. Um, but it's not actual sin. It's just the petty resentments that build up, and they, and they don't have the maturity and the ability to confess it and deal with it so that they can stay, uh, th so they can restore their friendship, and so it all goes south. But that's, that's like a short term over the course of, you know, um, one and a half semesters. But we see it all the time also longer term. I'm, I'm always surprised, um, if, if you've seen this, you'll have people where they'll come to the church and they, you know, the, somebody who, that's half of, more than half of the congregation here, move from other side of the country or whatever in order to belong to the church, in order to have their kids in the school, in order to whatever. And they'll come and they'll join the community. And when they get here, it's like, it's the promised land. It's the most wonderful thing ever. It's fantastic. Um, all sorts of blessings. And, you know, by year two, they are just so thrilled and grateful to be here, and they're starting to get other people to come here, and they're recruiting um, all their friends. And it's funny, as I'm, as I'm saying this, I know that I am describing <laughs> two-thirds of the congregation here. Um, and you, you start to draw your friends and say, you know, come, come and be a part of this community. And at five years, you're stepping into positions of leadership, and you're starting to be, um, you know, starting to run different things. And at eight years, maybe you're, you're possibly um, an elder candidate or something like that. And then at 10 years, there's this kind of cooling, you know? It, it just, it, um, the, their, their enthusiasm is being curbed, okay? It, it's just kind of slowing down a little bit. Still committed members of the community, but there's just this sort of cooling of the enthusiasm. And then it, it, at 12 years, is, there's, um, the cooling has turned into this sort of slight and subtle distancing. <laughs> We're just gonna kind of pull back a little bit. And then at about you know, 13 to 15 years, it's flat out bitterness, resentfulness, and then they're gone. And they're gone with, with just a slam the door and, and sort of an and stay out attitude uh, as, they, as they march off. And you wonder, what happened? I mean, it's not like if somebody comes and is here for six months and then realizes, you know, I'm not post mill, this just isn't working for me, then you can understand that. But, but you know, at, at 10 years, surely they knew about what we taught you know, by, by then. Surely they understood what they were here for. 
Um, but there's this sudden just cooling that's almost, it's inexplicable, and you can't understand why there's this distancing, why the friendships start to just kind of pull apart. And what it is, is it's just a long, long, slow playing out of exactly what happened with those freshman girls in the dorm that I was describing earlier, where the petty poison builds. When you've been here for 12 years, you have had more than enough opportunity to be sick of a lot of people. If, if, you have not, if you have not been dealing with the pettiness, with the little temptations that pop in your life and get you peeved at others, then at 12 years, you can be really one just bitter monkey, really just full of resentment and, 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 and really just provoked by just all it takes is a face from somebody in the church to walk by and, it's just, and you just cringe. It's like fingernails on the blackboard and you're sick of it. And to go back, it's just this petty poison of resentment that starts with the sidelong glance, slowly builds up, and not being confessed, not being dealt with. And this happens to churches. It's very rare, I think, that you find somebody that stays in the church that they started in or stays in a church for more than 15 to 20 years. It's, it's very hard to stay that long because your, your po- the, the toxicity builds up and you just need a clean something, a clean start. Happens in churches, happens um, in friendships, friendships that go just cold inexplicably, and sadly, it happens in marriages. You know, you get marriages, if you make it two years, you, you would think that you've gotten through all of the things that could really rock a marriage, but it's really much later that the marriages start to really fall apart, um, at, at least within the church, and it has to do with just building up these resentments. So unless we learn how to combat the sidelong glance, unless we learn how to deal with the petty poison, then we don't have any hope of being people who last in our covenant communities. And if you think about that, some of the teachings we've been blessed so much with is this understanding of a long-term vision of covenant faithfulness, of being able to build a community together where we would be with each other, um, where our children will be raised up around us, married with people that we knew and raising up their kids, and we'll get to see it all, and we'll get to sit and worship in the aisle next to them. There's a, there's a vision there that is glorious and would be a wonderful blessing, but the thing that I'm convinced that would be most likely to derail and kill that will be that sin that kills us at 15 years, at 12 to 15 years, that takes our feet out from under us. So what does it look like then to deal with this sin? First, and I think most obviously, you, you just have to confess it. You, but in order to do that, you have to learn to be brutally honest with yourself. You have to learn to be brutally honest with yourself. And this starts with your prayers. God, show me where I am letting things get into me that I'm not just dealing with quickly. But you've got to be brutally on, honest with yourself. These are petty little things that are popping into your head. And you want to have eyesight. You want to have spiritual dis, um, discernment so that you see these things as they're coming in. So you can grab it, know it name it for what it is and confess it. Call it sin and get rid of it. Nothing is too petty to be addressed. Confess it, get rid of it, don't let the cancer grow. And when you find yourself saying, here's a, this is a good little trick, when you find yourself saying, it's not fair, <laughs> when you find in your head that little, that little sentiment of, it's not fair, when you hear that in there, that should, alarm bells should be going off. When you hear yourself say, it's not fair, ask yourself, what was owed to you in this situation? What, what was fair? Um, what was owed to you in this situation such that you are really being wronged? And if you can't produce the verse, if you can't produce the verse that says, yes, this person owed this to you, then you need to confess it as sin. Um, you may have to confess the same stupid thought a thousand times in one day but don't let the poison build. And that's not, uh, that's not hyperbole. <laughs> it really could hit 1,000. <laughs> you might have to be just saying, forgive me for a 1,000 times in one day to get rid of it. But confess it every time it pops in, every time it, it's in your head, confess it, confess it, confess it, and get it out. You want to develop that healthy immune system that purges this quickly. So the first and most obvious step is regular confession of sin. The second one is live your life with an upward glance, not a sidelong glance. 
Okay? Remember, if you go back to the, the parable that we began, we began with, the problem was the workers in the vineyard were looking left and looking right, and they're seeing what everybody else is getting. That's the sidelong glance. What the owner of the vineyard did was he took them back to the contract, the objective promise, the deal that had been made. And what our objective deal is the gospel and what we have in Christ. And it's all the promises we have from God our Father. If we want to combat a sidelong glance, we have to have a vertical, an objective, upward gaze. Um, we, we sang Be Thou My Vision earlier, um, earlier in the service. And that's the perfect song to have in your head for this. When you're struggling with um, resentment or lust or these contentment issues, just sing that one through in your mind. The lyrics are very perfect for um, addressing this. I also, um, when, you, when you want to have an upward glance, an upward gaze, I should say, um, when you want to preserve that in your life, this is where it's, it's really good to use the attributes of God to fight your sin. And in particular, I find God's infinitude, his infinitude, a very, very helpful way to meditate on that and think about that, it's a very helpful way to deal with the sideways glance. And, and I know that might sound funny, but explain it. Um, I remember when I, when I was younger, I used to really, um, um, you know, I, I was told God um, wants to have a personal relationship with me, and that's why Jesus died for me. And so I took that very seriously. And so I have a personal relationship with God. And so that drove my prayer life. God and I are very close to one another. And, and, and I would speak to him as if we were just very, very close friends. And that's how it was. But one of the things that I started noticing was looking around and noticing all the other people at church and all of them being in prayer as well. And it started to really bug me because I felt wronged. <laughs> I have a close friendship with God. If God has the same close friendship with others, it's taking away from what I have. I don't mind that you all get to go to heaven, but there's a best friend status that I have. And, I, and it kind of bugged me to think that other people are getting this as well. I'm being cheated on in some way. But, but this is where then God's um, um, infinite character fixed that for me. Um, God is infinite. He is, and he is um, infinite in his omnipresence. He is infinite everywhere he is. He's infinite. And he is infinite with me. I have all of him. He gives me all of him. Um, in Christ, I get all of that. And because he's infinite, the fact that somebody to the left and somebody to the right also has that doesn't in any way subtract with what I've got. This is where I think this is the one little bit of good that calculus did for me, was the realization that infinity divided by two is still just infinity, right? So infinity divided by any, any finite number is still infinity. And so every single one of you can have all of God, all of him in his total infinite character is all there for you. And you don't have to compete with others in order to have God all the way there for you. And that means that in your story, it, the story, the life that you are living out, there is nothing that you have to compete with in other stories in order to have the entirety of God's attention. I can have an upward gaze knowing that everything I am doing, God is following closely and delighting in what I am doing. And it does not matter that my story is not that story, that I am not that man, or that I am not that family. It, that doesn't matter because I have all of God here. Um, think of it, this is from, a, so I did calculus and math, try biology. Um, you, you notice, uh, when you watch those um, weird nature shows, um, and you'll see like uh, the submarine that's going to um, some deep oceanic canal that has never been, um, never been surveyed before. And the spotlight comes on and you find some new and bizarre and crazy um, fish that the world has never seen. And as they study it, they find out it's got a reproductive cycle that is not used in any other creature anywhere. And it's got all these just crazy functions that you that are completely new. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. And when I see that, my first inclination is always, what a waste. 
You know, <laughs> wow, that was, you, all of that, it's new, it's crazy, it's, it's something that nobody's ever seen before. And you hide it all the way down there, and just like one time a sub passes by with the floodlights, and that's it? That's all it's going to be seen? With... Um, when we're, when we're like, uh, for instance, with Canon Press, if Canon Press has a really hot manuscript submitted, and they say, this is a good one, this is a really, really good one, then the whole job is, you know, everybody's mission is to make sure that everybody reads this one. All attention is brought to this one. This is the one we're going to get John Piper to blurb. This is the one that we're going to make sure is on blog and may blog regularly with little excerpts. This is the one we're going to make sure everybody sees it. A good one, you don't hide it because we want everybody to see it. But God's um, gaze is infinite. He's seeing everything. And he can have that fish down in the little oceanic canal. And he is delighting in that. It doesn't need to be seen by the rest of the world for him to take great delight in that. And that means every single one of your lives, whether you are the the king or queen of social media and everybody is following and seeing everything you do, or whether you are sort of living in the equivalent of the Oceanic Canal, if you're off in Beauville and nobody ever talks to you, okay, your life is still being lived out before God and it's infinite. You have infinite attention on what you're doing and your story has um, eternal and infinite significance because of that. I think of um, um, after Jesus' resurrection when he's speaking with um, Peter and, um, and Peter says to him, um, pointing at John, and he says, Lord, what about this man? What about this man? Because the rumor had gone around that John was not going to take, taste death. And, um, and Peter had been told how he's going to die. And Peter says, what about, what about him? And Jesus says to him, if I will that he remain till I come, What is that to you? You follow me. (laughs) What is that to you? You follow me. It's it's like um, Aslan when he says, that's somebody else's story. (laughs) But Jesus says, you, what about, what is, what is that to you? What is what's going on to your left? What is what's going on to your right? What is that to you? You have a story that you're living out. You have all of my attention on that. All of it is on there. Because you can't divide up God's attention. It's, it's omnipresent in its, um, it's infinite in its omnipresence. He is all of him, is, on, is focused on you. What does it matter what other people are seeing or doing? You follow him. You live faithfully before him. The widow who dropped her two mites. Remember when, when Jesus sees the widow who drops her two mites into the offering box. Um, and, and Jesus points out how she gave all that she had. Hers was the greatest offering. Think of how many hundreds of wealthy men were standing around her at that moment. And then she drops her two mites in. And Jesus sees that. If you wanted to compare and contrast, she obviously clearly had all sorts of room for envy. All sorts of room for envy. But God singled out what she did and was able to be right there to commend that. When we have an upward gaze, when we know that God is seeing what we do and we're living our life before him, it kills um, our desire to constantly get what's going on to our left and to our right, have that um, be driving our motivation. So the, second, the first was confess these things regularly. The second was to live with an upper gaze. The third is just to remember this is not the resurrection. This isn't it. Um, we're not in the resurrection right now. Your current circumstances are not your final inheritance. This is the hand that you've been dealt. This is not the final reward. So what you have before you is what God has, has given you. It's like when he, the parable of the talents, where he gives them the talents. The talents were not the reward. The talents were given to them to say, now, go, do with this what you will. In the same way that the widow only got two mites. That's all she had. Think of all the men with all the wealth all around her. They had all this wealth. She only had two mites. The money that each of them had, what they had in their wallet, that was just the hand that had been dealt What mattered was how they played the hand. And the widow with her two mites played her cards better than anybody else. She's the hero of the story, right? She's the one that you walk away with saying, this is the blessed one. What your current circumstances and the comparisons that you're making, you're you're missing the point. This is not the resurrection. This is not the inheritance. This is the hand that you're dealt. And God is looking to this to see how you play these cards. And then lastly, remember that grace is grace. Um, I, I, I think my, my wife has, has remarked growing up, 
uh, I think this was a, a, a Tom Garfield um, from Logos. If you say it's not fair at Logos, the answer was if we got what was fair, we'd all be in hell, right? Um, and, and that's just a really good thing to keep remembering. When we start doing this, it's not fair, it's not fair we're completely forgetting the gospel. We've, we've forgotten the whole basic story of the gospel. If we got what was fair, we would be headed um, to hell. But what God gives us is something very different, and that's what we're to be looking for. We're to be looking for grace. I think it's interesting, if you look at this passage, um, the Matthew 20 passage that we've been working through, and consider it in context for just a moment, the immediately preceding story in Matthew 19 is where you have Jesus... Um, interact with the rich young ruler. So you remember the rich young ruler comes in, says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him um, essentially the second half of the Ten Commandments, the, the laws relating to how we um, treat one another. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't tell lies. And he, and he goes through the second half of the, the Ten Commandments. And the, the rich young ruler says, yeah, I've kept all of those. And then, but Jesus has saved one. And he says, um, he, he's not listed, do not covet. He dropped the 10th commandment, and he didn't say don't covet. So he waits through until the guy has gone through all those, and he says, yeah, I've kept them all. And then he says, now, sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the rich young ruler is crushed because it we're told um, he walked out because he had great wealth. Um, he was somebody who was struggling with that flip side of the sideways glance, right? He's got all this wealth that he can't let go of. Um, and he's, he's clinging to it, and he can't uh, let go of it. And then, and then he walks out downcast, and then the disciples come up to Jesus and they say, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus tells them, yes, and because you've left everything, there's going to be 12 thrones and you're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel in the resurrection. And then he concludes it with saying, um, but many who are first will be last and the last first. The rich young ruler was first in this life, but he will be last because he couldn't let go of his, uh, of his lust, of his sideways glances. The disciples who had left everything, walked, left it all, and had, um, for them, it wasn't, didn't have to be upward because Jesus was right there. They put all of their gaze on Jesus. Because they did that, they will be made first. And then, so that's, verse, um, that's the very end of chapter 19. The very first verse of chapter 20, for the kingdom of heaven is like. This whole parable of the vine dressers is intended to illustrate this very principle, that the first will be last and the last will be first. And then and you notice at the very end of the parable of the vine dresser, verse 16, so um, the last will be first and the first last, for many are called but few are chosen. We, when we fight the sideways glance, we are trying to be first. And we're trying to, or sorry, when we fall to the sideways glance, we're trying to be first. But the point here is you're trying to be first in the wrong line. You're, it's, like, um, it's like you're at the DMV and there's all these long lines and you get in line and you start throwing elbows and cutting and sneaking and telling people, look at Santa Claus and they look and you cut ahead of them and you're doing all of this to get all the way to the front and you get yourself to the front and it's like the line for um, registering your tractor. It's the farm equipment line. It's the wrong line. <laughs> you're, you're putting everything into trying to be at the front of this line and it's completely misplaced. The line you want to be in is over there, and you get to the front of it by a completely different means. We drop, when we, when we fall and we succumb to the sideways glance, we're fighting to be at the front of the wrong line. Um, but we're promised here that the, that the line that we want to be in, that we will be at the front of, we will get there by being last. If you think, um, reminded of... Uh, Paul's exhortation in Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Here is the Son of God. Here is the second person of the Trinity, who humbles himself, leaves, the, leaves heaven, and comes to earth, humbles himself to take on the body of a man. And then as a man, humbles himself further to become the servant of all, to die the most gruesome and humbling death, the death on the cross. And Paul says, let the mind of Christ 
be in you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ had an understanding of what line he wanted to be in. He let go of the sideways glance. He let go of those um, claims of what he had by right. And he, and he gave himself. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. And, he, and Paul says, let that mind be in you. And then, if you continue on, Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's striking where he humbles himself, he walks to the back, and when he walks to the back of the line, you discover it is the very front of the line. This is the gospel. What Jesus did there, that is our salvation, that is the gospel. Let that mind be in you. Let go of the sideways glance. Let go of your claims to what is unfair and what ought to be fair. Let go of that and have the mind of Christ, what, the, the mind that Christ had when he pursued our salvation, let that mind um, be in us. We have this mind of Christ, though, by grace, through faith, the gift of God, so that we can't boast. It's all grace. So again, let grace be grace. And let's pray. Father, we know that by our own power, we are incapable of successfully addressing and purging even the smallest of lusts. Even the slightest bit of envy is too heavy of a burden for us to bear on our own. And so as we hear about your perfect standard of righteousness, as we hear what it looks like to walk in righteousness and to be perfect as you are perfect, we are tempted to give up hope, to be crushed under the weight of our own guilt. But Father, we know that you have promised us that once you've begun a good work in us, you will be faithful to complete it, to bring us to perfection. And if we have heard the strong words of condemnation of our sin, then we have heard because you, Lord, have given us ears to hear. And if you have given us ears to hear, then you have begun in us a work that you have promised will be brought to completion. Father, we have this promise from you. Bring us from guilt to repentance and from repentance to joy. And as we ask these things of you, we pray as your son taught us to say. Our Father, Our Father.